thank you for coming. This is um, going to be, I think, a really great talk. We have um, a little bit of business to go through. If you've been to other talks this morning, you have to, unfortunately, bear with me. Um, but please turn off all mobile devices if you have any on. And um, we want to thank the um, uh, sponsors here. Bookstock is totally volunteer run, as I'm sure most of you know, it's free to the public. And we really depend on a lot of support from our community and from the following organizations who very generously give us um, help with Bookstock. And the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, Pauline Davenport's Children's Fund of the Vermont Community Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, and the Woodstock Learning Lab. And a special thanks to our media sponsor, the Vermont Standard, WCTVE, Woodstock Community Television for taping all of our author sessions. You can see them back there <laughs> in the hall. Vermont's oldest independent bookstore, the Yankee Bookshop, and Sustainable Woodstock. Um, the speaker will speak for half an hour, and then approximately, and then 10 minutes for questions. And the session will end at 20 minutes to 4, promptly. Um, book signing will be here at the end of the um, questions. And so now I will introduce our next speaker. Uh, he was a research professor in the conservation biology area for many years and moved to Vermont a few years ago, 12 I believe. And I think he did a very interesting transition in going from writing authorship of textbooks and um, editor of an international scientific journal to writing a nonfiction book of essays. And yes, um, textbooks and journals are not fiction. I mean, they're nonfiction, but they're, <laughs> it's a bit different. And then he made a leap that I think very few scientists make, and that is to fiction. And his latest, and actually first, I believe, novel, uh, The Wizard of Odd, you see up here, is uh, his latest book. And um, I just want to note that yesterday on VPR, um, on Morning Edition, Mitch Wortley interviewed him. And it is now out on the uh, website for VPR. Anybody would like to listen to it. So I'm going to introduce Gary Maffey. Did I say it right? You did. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Thank you all for coming. Um, I seem to be the, the token novelist in this otherwise great session on uh, history and nonfiction, but we're going to switch to fiction now for a little bit. So I'll be doing a more traditional reading from a book. There's no slides or anything like that. Um, I am a scientist by training and profession, as Sherry said, in ecology and conservation biology. And in science, you write a lot, publish or perish. Um, so I spent my adult life writing textbooks and papers and reports, etc. And of course, it's all nonfiction. At least you hope it is in science. Um, in 2007, my wife and I moved to Vermont, and we loved it. And we loved it so much that in 2014, I published a book of essays called Van Cortlandt Chronicles: A Celebration of Life in a Small Vermont Town. I live on Van Cortlandt Road, hence the name. Um, and it's a, a book of S observations and experiences and quirkiness about Vermont, and uh, it's, it was a lot of fun. But it was still nonfiction. It was a love song to Vermont, but it's still nonfiction. Now I made a major transition into fiction, and there, it's a huge difference. Science is all about observing and embracing the world as it is. You take it apart, you learn how things work, and you report on it. You start with reality and you break it down, it involves objectivity and searching for truths. Fiction is the opposite. You start with nothing, and you create a world. You populate it with people and places and events, and you try to get readers to believe it. Uh, so you, you're creating something from nothing, but it still needs to feel truthful and be honest. And 
in doing so, I needed to learn to take off the scientific shackles uh, and the constraints you feel in science. And let me tell you, boy, was it fun. I had a blast doing this book. Briefly, um, this book, The Wizard of Odd, a Vermont tale of community devotion, um, is in the fictional village of Ottertown in the Northeastern Kingdom. It centers around a country store, which is the epicenter and the heart and soul of a town, but the store is in danger of being lost to the town, and that means a lot of things to folks there. It's, the book is fundamentally about community, about love of place, devotion to a town and its people, and it's really about every wonderful small town in Vermont and in many other places in the country, too. So I will start reading. And I have two prologues, actually, which set up the book. And my first prologue begins, Saturday morning, five years ago. Simon Otterton carefully maneuvered down the old wooden stairs into the dank basement, wisely holding onto the handrail, which, like the steps, was original equipment. He wasn't sure which creaked more, the stairs or his achy joints. This trip used to be so much easier, he thought to himself, but it should be a simple and quick one today. Just grab a number 10 can of baked beans and head back up to his customers. Shuffling over to the wooden storage shelves full of cans and jars, Simon couldn't help but notice what he'd been trying to ignore. It was becoming more evident that his mostly bald head was getting closer to the ceiling joists at the north end than it used to be, and he was pretty sure he wasn't still growing. Yet one more sign that this old building had seen better days and, and was in a slow but sure state of decline. Having spent all of his 92 years here, it was difficult to accept the steady, incremental decay of something he so dearly loved. Today looked pretty much like yesterday, so how could he be sure that real decline was taking place? Just like with his own body, time, that subtle and covert devil, took its imperceptible toll each day, surely not noticeable as it occurs, but callously apparent in full hindsight. His hip did seem to be more painful than, what, five years ago? He did seem to recall that his eyesight used to be clearer and he had better night vision. It indeed used to be easier to turn his head while parallel parking. When had he decayed so much? When had the building fallen into disrepair? Was this just his imagination, or did he have a real problem? Could he deny the natural aging process much longer? As Simon made his way further toward the north wall, he pulled up short. Even in the dim light and heavy shadow cast by the one bare ceiling bulb, he could not ignore a new development. Two more foundation stones had fallen out of place and were now lying on the hard-packed dirt floor. This brought the total to, what, seven now? No wonder he seemed to be getting closer to the ceiling joists. The building was sinking, and this could no longer be dismissed as simply his imagination. Simon could feel the weight of previous generations pressing on him. His father, Clive, great-grandfather An grandfather Andrew, and especially his great-grandfather, Peter, the legendary man who built all this. And then there was his son, John, who tragically was no longer here to carry on the tradition. They all depended on him to keep this thing alive and well. And let's not forget the townspeople, who would be lost and adrift without the place. And of course, there was Simon himself. He loved this old building, every creaky, worn, and aging part of it, and all it had held and done over more than 13 decades, including his own nine and counting. It was part of his essence, and he was part of it. If it died, surely he would die with it. So might the town. This store was its lifeblood, and its loss could be like a fatal coronary to village life. As Simon slowly ascended the stairs, he knew what he had to do. He would make some calls on Monday morning and start to deal with something he had dreaded and tried to ignore for far too long. He had absolutely no idea how he would pay for it, but if he wanted the Otterton Country Store to remain standing, he had to do something soon. As he reached the upper landing he opened the door and, and opened the door, Simon looked down at his empty hands and in frustration snapped his red suspenders. Jeez I'm crow, I forgot the damn beans. Back down he went. That's the end of the first uh, prologue. The next one, so that was five years ago. The next one is Tuesday afternoon, seven months ago. Kate Langford felt stunned as she opened the door to her 15-year-old Subaru. She leaned over to drop the file of paperwork onto the passenger seat, sat down, 
and gripped the steering wheel like it was the last life jacket on a stormy sea. As she stared blankly into the bright October colors behind the small parking lot of the old Victorian that housed Schmidt and Nielsen Esquire, she reflected on the last 45 minutes and the bomb that her grandfather's lawyer, Newt Nielsen, had dropped on her out of the blue. If she had hit, been hit from behind with a two by four, she could not have been more surprised. Yes, she knew she would inherit the family store. She realized that grandfather Simon loved and trusted her like no other, and that nobody else would be a logical benefactor and caretaker of the building and business that had passed through five generations before her. She had the experience to run the place, to serve Outer Town's residents, to make a decent living, and perhaps even a rewarding life under those old timbers. All of that was fully expected, and though she missed him terribly this last month after his death at 96, she knew she could carry on the traditions and the responsibilities that the inheritance entailed. But she had not been prepared for the bonus surprise package attached to the deal, a $116,000 debt. And the debt needed to be paid off in less than 16 months or the bank would own the store. It was nearly an eighth of a million dollars for Christ's sake. Kate had all of $4,000 in her life savings. Gramps, what the hell were you thinking, she shouted to the empty space, slamming her hands on the steering wheel. And why didn't you tell me about this? Did you think it would just go away, that nobody would notice? After a long and deep exhalation and some staring out the side window at an adjacent cow pasture, some of the pressure abated. Kate knew, she had done, Kate knew he had done the best he could under the circumstances and now realized that what she thought was a little forgetfulness and slight dementia had actually been far more serious. Simon had had little choice but to incur the debt over four years ago or risk the place falling down. But why hadn't he told her about it? Why hadn't he asked for help? He missed so many payments, he struggled so mightily, and she could have been there for him had he only confided in her. Between what now appeared to be serious dementia and perhaps his fierce and deep sense of Yankee independence and pride, he never mentioned a word to her about the loan. Another deep breath and she loosened her grip on the steering wheel. Pink soon replaced the white that had shrouded her knuckles. Now finally seeing the colorful maples, oaks, beeches, and ashes behind the building, she began to focus and breathe normally. I forgive you, Grandpa Simon, but I sure wish you hadn't waited for your death to share this little tidbit with me. It would have really helped knowing this, oh, maybe a couple of years ago, don't you think? Realizing that this bemoaning would get her nowhere and that she needed to start the drive south from Newport to face her newfound challenge, Kate inserted the key and turned over the reliable old Subaru engine. Okay, old girl, you can do this, she thought to herself. You're smart and energetic and tough, and you'll figure a way out of this little mess. You survive that asshole of a husband, you can survive this. You've got it in you. As she backed out of the space and headed down the driveway and through the stunning and calendar-worthy pastoral landscapes that would take her home, Kate hoped she really was as confident as she had just told herself. She would need all of that and more if she was to clear up this mess and make a life here. So those are the prologues. This is a drink of water. I'm going to dry my mouth. <laughs> or so I say. <laughs> or so I say, yeah. You don't know what's really in there. So now we go to chapter one. Wednesday, May 1st, 4.45 a.m. The alarm pierced the quiet morning air like an ice pick shattering glass and startled Kate Langford out of a sound sleep and a pleasant dream. Damn, she thought as she slapped the sinister device into silence. Quarter to five already. Seems like I just laid down. She immediately tried to remember the dream, but all she could recall were birds flying free and unencumbered. Though disoriented and a bit woozy from the abrupt shift of deep sleep to waking consciousness, she knew from experience that if she didn't get up immediately, she would only make things worse for herself. So Kate took a deep breath, swung her long athletic legs out from under the warm, cozy mound of bedding, and settled her bare feet onto the cold wooden floor. Her whole body shivered in the cool darkness. It was early May and the morning chill still had a bite to it, but it was, it was a significant improvement over some of those icy winter mornings she had just been through, even though this winter had been warmer than usual with little snow and, as a result, an even more depressed economy in the kingdom than usual. Slipping out of her flannel nightshirt and into her regular uniform, a t-shirt, flannel shirt, blue jeans, woolen socks, L.L. Bean rubber mock boots, black fleece vest, 
she thought as she did so many mornings, there's got to be a better way to almost make a living. <laughs> Shuffling to the bathroom, Kate flicked on the light, another shock to her system, relieved her bladder, splashed water on her face, brushed her teeth, and began to feel awake. Looking at the dazed face, face staring back from the mirror, she muttered, Okay, bring it on, world. I'm ready for another day in odd. Kate flipped on the second light switch in the morning and started down the creaky, deeply worn stairs that she knew all too well. These sure have seen some action, she thought, holding the old wooden railing, smooth to a glossy finish by well more than a century of wear. Reaching the first floor, she opened the door to the right of the landing and walked through. Turning on her third light switch, the banks of fluorescent lights flickered on and brightly illuminated the four rows of shelves with their wide variety of canned and dry goods, the wine rack with over 40 selections, the corner nook that held the small bank of ancient brass post office boxes, the glass doored coolers of drinks and dairy products, the dining area with its five tables, the small kitchen to her left where she spent so much of her life of late, the entire black hole that was threatening to suck that life right out of her. Now in its 137th year, Odd Country was preparing to open yet again. It had witnessed and participated in so much history, so much life, both good and bad. Horses to automobiles, the Wright brothers to moon landings, two world wars and a depression, Korea, Vietnam, the 60s counterculture, pencil and paper to the internet, September 11th, Iraq, globalization, and all the generations that grew up and died here, each certain that theirs was the last decent bunch and convinced that the good old days were gone. If these old walls could talk, all the stories they could tell. But now, after so many recent days in the red, all of that history was at risk, and Kate desperately hoped for some positive cash flow with the arrival of spring. If things did not turn around soon, and in a big way, she didn't know if the store would be open for its 138th year. Kate entered the kitchen and used a long fireplace match to light the pilot, which then fired the burner of the vintage Heartland gas oven that her great-grandfather Clive had acquired nearly 100 years before and had been so proud of. This initiated the familiar routine that began most of her days, making her trademark cinnamon and walnut buns, always in high demand by her faithful regulars and the few lucky visitors fortunate enough to stumble upon them. By expert memory made perfect by repetition, she mixed the flour, sugar, salt, and wet ingredients, rolled out the dough, felt its cool stickiness, shaped it into long sheets, spread the rich cinnamon nut butter mixture on top, rolled them up, cut them into buns, laid them on the grease baking sheets, and put them into the now hot oven. Four dozen, like clockwork. Kate never failed to appreciate the rich smell of the cinnamon nut mixture, and it often took her back just for a moment to a carefree time as a little girl with no worries or responsibilities when her mother made those same buns each morning. She can imagine being the Eight-year-old tomboy again, tucked in her warm bed upstairs, the rich smell of cinnamon buns drifting up through the ancient floorboards to her room, making her feel safe, secure, and well-loved, and enticing her to get out of bed and embrace a new day with its endless mysteries and wondrous possibilities. She would run down the stairs, pigtails flying, into the welcoming arms of her mother, and they would split one of the fresh buns hot out of the oven. She had thought her mother was the most beautiful woman in the world, and had always hoped she would take after her. She did. Brought swiftly back to the present by the realities of her current life, Kate next started two pots of coffee brewing. Uh, I'm sorry, the rich and familiar smell that filled the cool air always helped to perk up and comfort her. Needlessly glancing at the clock, she could have predicted the time, plus or minus a minute, 5.28. Her fastest time ever was 5.25. Slowest on a morning with a bad cold, 541. Today, 32 minutes until opening, when old Phil and Jubal would come lumbering up the front steps, coffee mugs in hand. And so it went, just like yesterday, just like tomorrow. Kate took a deep breath to gaze out from the kitchen through the serving counter and onto the, uh, into the store to appreciate what she had and what she could lose. It was a gorgeous old building with a deep and fascinating history, and she would do anything to keep it. Its loss would be a personal and public tragedy, and as a sixth-generation owner, she felt the strong pull of ancestral gravity to keep it going. She must keep it going. Her community, the place where she grew up and which she loved and whose people she felt a close kinship with, depended on her and the store for so much of its core identity, as well as everyday shopping needs. 
It was an honor to continue the family tradition and to serve Ottertown, and she did not want to be the one responsible for its demise, even if that awful possibility was inherited along with the building and through no fault of her own. She was paying the price for someone else's mistake, but pay she must. Now I'm going to be skipping some things along here, some details, and you could read them on your own. In the interest of time, she goes on, she's preparing breakfast for the folks coming in, and she finally has a minute to pop a bagel in the, in the toaster and have breakfast. So we pick it up again. Before she could finish her bagel spread with creamy butter from Carson's dairy, Jody Simpson arrived through the front door to wait tables from 6 until 7.30 when she would catch the bus to finish her junior year at North Country Union High in Newport. Jody was a good kid, dependable, respectful, and well-spoken, unusual for a 17-year-old these days. She was both athletic and artsy and participated in field hockey, basketball, and school plays as much as her busy schedule permitted. Her long and straight brown hair pulled into a ponytail for work framed a plain but pretty face with big brown eyes, a long nose, and thin but confident lips, and her positive and outgoing personality quickly won over all who crossed her path. Morning, Miss Kate, said Jody in a voice far too cheery for this time of day and for her age. Morning back at you, Jody, said Kate in as cheery a tone as she could muster this early. Uh, Mr. Keller and Mr. Hatterley are coming up the steps. Are we open yet? Sure, Jody, let them in. Let's go ahead and start the day. Jubal Keller always swung by Phil Hatterley's uh, house and picked, up, picked him up for their thrice weekly breakfast at the store. Phil was getting on in years, who wasn't, and appreciated the ride. His shrapnel souvenir from Korea gave him a nasty limp, his eyesight was shot, and he no longer drove, wisely giving up his license two years earlier. Jody opened the front door, turned the closed sign to open, and welcomed the old gents who each carried their own odd country mugs with their names on them. Good morning, kind sirs, greeted Jody with an exaggerated curtsy. And how are you on this fine day? You bucking for a big tip already, young lady, joked Jubal Keller while wiping his shoes on the entry rug. Let me get some coffee in me before you go flirting with me, he said with his trademark crooked grin. <coughs> Following close behind, Phil Hatterley barely managed, hey kid, he was a man of few words until his second cup, whereupon he would happily launch into full action, usually complaining about the government and promoting his latest conspiracy theory. Keller and Hatterley took the usual seats at the big corner table, the largest one in the place and the only one that would hold three or four or maybe even five more of the oddballs, as they called themselves. Now that's two words, both capitalized, oddballs. The oddballs were Ottertown's version of the ever-present group of old guys that gathered each more early morning, early mornings, at every country store, cafe, and diner in New England to get away from their wives if they still had them, seek the com company of com contemporaries, talk about the town, start arguments, ping each other as they called their mock mockery, and solve all the world's problems, all within an hour or two. Jubal and Phil were always the first two on hand, as neither slept well, so they had a good 15 minutes to themselves until the others showed up, uh, by which time they would be on their second mugs. Jody poured their steaming coffees without asking and backed away to prep the other four tables, while the boys sat drinking to the new day while waiting for the uh, compatriots to shuffle in. Phil Hatterley was a physically imposing man, which he used to his advantage when arguing politics about which he was passionate. An unwavering conservative, Phil was a verbal bully if given half a chance. Well over six feet tall and well over a healthy weight, he sported a full head of gray hair, rarely seen under his various and ubiquitous baseball style caps, and a leathery, weathered skin from a lifetime of hard and honest work outdoors. Jubal Keller was a smaller man, kindly and well-liked by all. Politically moderate, he had a ready smile and was more accepting and less judgmental than Phil. They made for an unlikely duo, yet had retained their tight friendship for decades. Predictably, at 6.18, set your watch, in came only Oswald, whose unlikely name demanded frequent explanation, which he'd been giving his whole life. The story goes that his mother, May Lynn Oswald, had heard nothing but horror stories about childbirth from her mother and several aunts. Their family line was rather narrow-hipped, you see, with pelvic structures not well suited to the rigorous demands of childbirth, and as a result, they tended to have difficult and painful deliveries. Consequently, 19-year-old May Lynn was frightened to death going into her first delivery 10 months after her marriage to Henry Oswald, a fear that was well justified after 31-hour labor. 29 of which were pure agony, given that it was in a time 
uh, in place without epidurals or much effective pain relief. An hour after giving birth, when her husband finally entered the room to see his wife and newborn son, the exhausted, sweaty, and angry May Lynn declared, Henry, take a good long look at this here newborn, because that's the onlyest child you'll ever get out of me. I'm never doing this again. To enforce that promise in writing, she named her boy Only, with no middle name that could distract from her intention of, quote, never doing this again. <laughs> And to ensure that this would, in fact, be her onlyest child, she refused to have any marital relations with Henry from that day on, fearing that if she did, she would end up right back in the same place. That denial lasted two months before Henry took off for greener pastures, which was just as well given that he'd become a useless alcoholic. Six months later, she heard that Henry had died in a car crash while silly drunk and chasing skirts over New Hampshire. She felt little grief or remorse, as it was not much of a loss for her or the world, and she went on to raise only Oswald in the best way she could. Like Johnny Cash's boy named Sue, only had spent much of his early life defending his honor and his name, and had consequently developed a tough exterior and learned to take grief from nobody. For his first several decades, he used the second syllable of his name and went by Lee. But that habit was quickly abandoned in late November of 1963, when Lee Oswald bore far too great a resemblance to Lee Oswald. Nowadays, he sometimes, sometimes used a nickname taken from the first syllable of his unfortunate name, Own. Less than a minute after Olney's entrance, in shuffled Silas Miller, guardedly making his way to the table. Silas was slight of build and in good shape despite his physically inactive career in banking. However, his failing eyesight and macular degeneration slowed down his actions the last few years, and he was necessarily cautious and deliberate in finding his way around. Bringing up the rear, two minutes later, always the last one, moseyed Stephen S. Benson. Stephen's middle name, oddly enough, was Stephen. And it's spelled V-E-N and P-H-E-N. Oh, okay. Um, he was named for his two grandfathers, who were Stephen and Stephen. Upon his birth, his parents argued for three days about which spelling would be adopted for their new son, as both wanted to honor their father, and neither would back down. The impasse finally ended when they decided to simply use both names. They flipped a coin to see which would be first. His maternal grandfather won and became Stephen Stephen Benson. <laughs> His friends just called him Steve. Unfortunately, Steve's parents had a lifelong habit of constant bickering over any old thing, offspring names being among the least of their battlegrounds. The relentless tension in the Benson household that resulted from their persistent combativeness took its toll on young Stephen Stephen's nerves, and he developed an unfortunate stutter that stayed with him his entire life. Uh, to this day, he paid the price for his parents' inability to simply get along. Okay, I'm going to skip a few things here. Um, I settled in. Okay, as Jody took the last order, in trumped Willard Bennett, an occasional member and oddest duck of the group, who noisily and gracelessly plopped down at one end of the table. Willard was a bachelor pig farmer, never married, probably never even dated, and one could easily see why. Willard was crude, both physically and socially. He bathed far, far too infrequently, even were he not steeped in pig manure each day, which he was. Um, his feeding habits were not unlike those of his livestock, with whom he spent far too much time, and he sported a rather active digestive system that frequently expelled interesting sounds and pungent gases from both ends. He rarely seemed to notice. His dozen or so remaining teeth were hideous from lack of care and a steady habit of guzzling Mountain Dew, and his breath could pretty much knock a buzzard off a three-day-old carcass. <laughs> to, to complete the package, Willard changed his clothes only weekly, if that, and he rarely controlled a foul mouth. All in all, Willard Bennett was quite the specimen. Still, he was part of the group, part of the town, and he was grudgingly accepted by his buddies, if not physically embraced. Hey, you boys, you old fart bastards, how the hell are you? Expelled Willard with a big smile as he settled in, fully comfortable in his noxious role and oblivious to the heads turning to void his acrid breath. The boys all muttered their return greetings, trying not to encourage further verbal exchange, lest it burn their, their nostrils and upper GI tracts and ruin their breakfasts. And we have a call. Just when they needed a distract, I'm probably you know, a few minutes over, but we'll take it out of the question now. Just when they needed a distraction, like a gift from God, here came Paul Johnson, the youngest and most formally educated member of the group, a 40-something organic farmer with an agriculture degree from U UVM, whom they sometimes called Hippie Boy. Paul enjoyed hanging out with these older fellows when he could, and he tried to pick through their nonsense and verbal detritus to find the hidden pearls of wisdom that inevitably come with age. 
Unfortunately, Paul's smarts did not help him avoid, to, uh, avoid having to sit right next to Willard as this was the last available chair. He took a deep breath while still standing and tried to limit his subsequent insulation to shallow efforts. Jody took his order and won from Willard while keeping back an extra two feet from the ladder. Um, so, P Paul, queried Steve Benson, quickly trying to steer conf conversation away from Willard and his corpse-like breath. How's the fly f f fishing doing yet? Been out m m much? Nah, not yet at all yet this year, Steve. After all that winter rain and runoff, I want to let the streams calm down and warm up a bit. We'll just be thrashing around mostly and trying not to fall in. Maybe another week or two if I can get away from early planting. I'm not like you retired types who can do whatever they want whenever they please. I've still got a farm to run and it doesn't run itself. I need to work first and fly fish second. Hey, hippie boy, I still work plenty, responded Phil Hatterley, his beefy, cracked and withered hands caressing his coffee mug like a well-loved pet. I work at getting up in the morning. I work at peeing past my old prostate. I work at putting my pants on without falling over. I work at chewing my food with bad dentures. Never worked so damn hard in all my life. <laughs> the boys chuckled knowingly. Getting old wasn't pretty for any of them. And at any given time, one or another faced significant health challenges. I'm going to skip to the end here. He, he goes on a conservative rant there, but you can read that. At that point, Jody came by with the first round of breakfast orders, and the boys calmed down and minded their manners as, they set the plates in front of the hungry, as she set the plates in front of the hungry crew. The rich and comforting smells of eggs, bacon, sausages, home fries, and those cinnamon walnut buns not only soothed their minds, but helped to cover up the various stenches emanating from Willard's end of the table. Back in the kitchen, Kate was keeping up with steady breakfast orders coming in from the several other customers that were starting to fill up the small eatery, happy that early morning cash flow looked good. Might be a decent day, she thought to herself. About time. Maybe things are turning around. She hadn't had too many decent days of late. In fact, she hadn't been much in the black since holiday sales in December, and her debts were piling up fast while her cash reserves were rapidly depleting. Kate wrestled each day with ways to bring the Otterton country store, the odd country, back to some degree of solvency, of sustainability, of long-term viability. So far, she had few answers, and right now, she couldn't see a way out to save her soul or the store. That's the end of chapter one. Um, we have ten minutes of questions, and then... I think I saw your hand first. How does the science story to write dialogue? How, how, how does that work? Uh, the scientists read dialogue. If you want, I, I learned if you want to learn to write, read, 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 read good stuff. I read books about writing fiction. I read books about dialogue. I read, and you pay attention. So the funny thing about dialogue, they tell you in writing. On the one hand, it has to be very realistic. On the other hand, it can't be anything like we talk about. So how are you? I'm okay, how are you? I'm good. What's going on? Well, not much. You don't write, you can't write dialogue like that. It has to move along. So you have to find a spot where it's realistic, but not too realistic because it would be really boring. So you have to punch it up and you have to keep it moving along. So there's this tension there between talking like you would talk and keep it moving along. So it's just practice. But I, I had a lot of fun doing dialogue. I think you, I saw your hand and then yours, so let me go in that order. Because you saved the store, and I'm asking because the Bonner General store was saved because there are a lot of rich people in Bonner, I guess, and the uh, Kathleen Dole was not trying to save the, the, the conference store, but you're talking to a lot of resistance from the select men who want them differently. So I'm very curious about how this well, I can't tell you <laughs> what happens here. Um, and you may have to read right to the end to find out. But um, yes, this does, unfortunately, and I learned this as I was writing and, and even after writing, unfortunately, this novel is eerily uh, real. And there's so many general stores, country stores in Vermont that have gone under, are going under, may go under, and it's a tragedy. And I'm hoping that this helps maybe raise awareness of, of that problem throughout the state. There's something similar happening in schools. Yeah. That are being closed. Sure. Yeah. You and had bookstores, uh, too. I was, and bookstores, yes. I was interested in the beginning, you said you were going to talk about the oddities 
I'll put more, and you did. <laughs> what you read was four of them. Uh, and you, you mentioned just a few minutes ago that it was eerily real. Is that what you said? Yeah. Eerily real. Um, particularly about the general store. Could you just comment generally? Don't give me any more yeah. <laughs> examples of the oddities of, of Vermont, but could you comment uh, what do you think what you read is pretty <coughs> typical and, and perhaps some of the reasons for it? Typical of the rest of the book? No, typical of Vermont. I, I tried to be typical very. Of the people of Vermont. Yeah, I tried to be very realistic <laughs> about people in Vermont. And, you know, your sources come from many different areas and I try to pay attention in life and some of these characters were um, inspired by people that I know um, in characters that I might like to know um, they're not all I mean, there's some negative characters in this book as well um, so I tried to to get a collection of characters that represented a town and to me, one of the messages that I wanted to come out of this book is not only love of place and love of town, but tolerance. And particularly, particularly in this day and age with our political, horrific political situation the way it is, I wanted to show conservatives and liberals and old and young and everything all getting along so well. Now, um, okay, yes. Okay. I understand community, a very small town, other than this. You have these people who accept the art goals there. There's one thing that's missing in the group, and that's a woman. And I wonder if that was done intentionally, or if... In, in this book? In this book. I'm not, I mean, not the owner, but the guys who congregate in the morning, they're all men. Yeah. And women don't have time for it. Well, <laughs> whatever reason. No, that's not true. There are many women of my age or retired or whatever. But, you know, in come of a certain age, and maybe the younger woman would say, whoa, don't even talk that way, Carol. Because women, even a mixed group, be as unforgiving and unforgetful and accepting of someone with bad breath or crazy theories to according to them. It's just something to think about. Yeah, and the reason I did that, um, we have a couple of groups in my town of Brandon who are who do this. They're all men. When we travel around, we, we would go into a breakfast place early morning. Any, almost any small town American, here's the old guys sitting there. So I think it reflects reality. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing and whether women should be incorporated is a whole other issue. But um, the old guys tend to, in our town, the old guys tend to do this and the women tend to have book clubs. So that's... Do you remember in Search of Inspiration, go to Miss Lindenville up in Lindenville at Caledonia County? Okay. Show up there at 545 and... Uh, they're the regulars sitting in their same seat that are reserved, but you don't know it. Yeah. And uh, they actually <laughs> had the experience of saving someone's life one time by calling the police when he'd been short for breakfast at 5.30. Mm -hmm. oh, right. And that's they're true. Just full of stories like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's great. That's great. Yes, sir. You know, uh, what, I, what I miss in the book, and this is very small, where is the pot-bellied stove that they're all uh, wrapped around? Yeah. <laughs> Number one. And number two, I grew up in New York City. Nobody can grow up with nine million people. Everyone grows up with a country store, right. a little place where you congregate. And yeah, I think that's the next here. book that shows that nobody grows up in a big city. You have to grow up in a neighborhood. Right. And then you have to have a local store that's your home away from home. Yeah. There's only, only so many physical things I could put in this book. I do have this old stove in the kitchen. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, there is no potbelly stove. But you know, there's a number of things that are not in there. But then there are a number of things that are in there that aren't. You know, so you, you do the best you can. Oh, I was kind of half kidding. I just, yeah. when's he going to add, when's he going to describe that yeah. stove? Well, maybe, maybe it's there. Maybe you have to read. <laughs> <laughs> or you don't know what's going to be there. You don't know what's going to happen. And I'll tell you, a lot of stuff happens. <laughs> it's not all nice. <laughs> If it is a woman who's going to come in and chat with the guys, yeah. See, that's, that's what I'm talking about. 
Yeah, and it doesn't work. Okay, we have a question here. <laughs> Unfortunately, I arrived late, so maybe you told. Is there really an Otterton Company? No, no, place? this is fiction. But so I've had a number of people say, "God, I love this place, and I love these people. I want to go visit." Yeah. And I say, I, first, my first answer is, I want to go visit too. And my second answer is, you can go visit. Go to any one of a couple hundred of small Vermont towns, and you'll find them there. You'll find pieces so that's of that there. Photoshopped or whatever. That is, that is photoshopped, yeah. There's a whole book of the Vermont County stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are out there. I mean, this, this book is about, you, you can go to those towns and find those people. Not those exact ones, but. They're, they're all out there. Thanks. You should have about oh. one more question. Okay. She said she liked the time, so I have to tell you how this happened. August 2015, we're over at, I think it's that way, Quichi Antique Mall yeah. in the book things, and we're back over there today. I'm looking at, there's a whole wall of novels, and I'm scanning, scanning, and I saw in front of me The Wizard of Oz. I said, wait, where is that? And I looked. And I could not find a book that had wizard in it, and I could not have, find a book that had odd in it. I thought, what a great title for a book. Somebody should write a book called The Wizard of Odd. Then I said, I should write a book called The Wizard of Odd. And that's how it started. I had no idea. I had zero idea what this book would be. What's a wizard? What's odd? Where is it? Six months I thought about it. It drove me crazy until I formed some ideas, and then I started writing. I got this book. I, I, I had no idea where it would go. It was just the title. Is there a dumber way to write a book? No. No. A crazier no. way to write a book? I don't know. It's a great word. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Did you, uh, have, are you observing also the people who are from someplace else versus the old timers? In other words, the ones who are from downstate? Is it I do have some, some yeah. people from outside that come through. Some are that are really nice, one or two that are not so pleasant, um, and that bring their um, culture from uh, other places into town, and it might be louder and more crude. Sometimes there's tension at town meeting. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gary. Yeah. Thank you very much.